Hello and welcome to our Lovely time. Lovely to have your company once again. Janice, do you remember many years ago, we did a program, a TV program called You Don't Say, mm. where we had to mime everything and took us charades. months. Charades. It was a, well, you know, sort of like charades, game yeah. charades. And I think there was about 15 or 20 actors on the show yeah. and we all had to mime whatever we were doing. Well, believe it or not, one of the girls who was on that program with us, Janine Bryan, is with us in this episode. She has had the most extraordinary life. And I haven't seen her since, have well, you? No. no. No, it was she's, a lovely surprise. She's been living in the Himalayas. She's also written, I think she said, 90 books no. up to date. Wow. Some for children, some for... Oh, just extraordinary amount of things. Now, tell me what I'm saying okay. to you from that program. <gasps> He's going over there. See you. Bye. <laughs> I would like now, if you'll follow me, to uh, introduce to the program Julie Black, who is the CEO of Arthritis South Australia, and also Simon Trott and his seven-year-old daughter, Lakeisha. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Jen. Nice to see you here. You too. Now, I have a few questions that I have to find, um, but it is more commonly known that arthritis, well, you expect it to be in older people, not children. That's right. And, you know, one of the things um, each of the arthritis foundations are about is increasing awareness. So many people connect it with being an old person's condition when, in fact, it, it can affect children too. Yes, but it is very um, unusual. But uh, where would they go for help if, uh, if, if you do have a child that has... Uh... Well, um, the statistics show that one in every thousand children can experience um, arthritis and it's important um, for people to, to know what's normal for the child and if they're experiencing pain. Um, we've seen um, things where children have been walking um, and then suddenly they stop and they're really irritable, they're in pain. That's not normal and people need to go along to their GP and who can do a series of tests and things and then get referred um, to a specialist. Simon, over to you. Um, when did you notice with Lakeisha? How old was she when you first noticed her? Uh, she was actually uh, very close to one. Really? Uh, yeah, that young? very, very early. So, yeah, it's uh, a bit scary when you get it to that age. Absolutely. <laughs> but how? What were the symptoms that you noticed then with Lakeisha? Um, well, she actually began to walk very early right. in life. So once she started to actually mobilise her joints and start using her joints, she actually kind of had a distinctive walk. And we actually noticed it by actually watching an, another show. Um, there was a person that was just a little bit older than Lakeisha and yeah. they had a distinctive walk. And with Lakeisha having that kind of same walk, we thought, oh, this is not good. This so could what, be what are you saying, um, a distinctive walk? Was it like she was um, You could just struggling. tell, yeah, exactly. It was, it was just like in pain. So um, she wasn't actually showing, like telling you it, well, at no, that was age? No, not at that age, no. yeah. So she actually began to walk early and yeah, within months uh, she just started to get this walk pattern and then all of a sudden didn't seem to walk as well anymore, uh, yeah. kind of went backwards which was the worry, and just by chance we were watching a show. As I said, uh, oh. it had exactly the same features that she was walking, and we just thought, oh, we should get this checked out. This could be juvenile arthritis, and unfortunately so it was. It was. Mm. Um, so how now, uh, at this age, yeah. Lakeisha, I should ask you <laughs> the questions, how often do you have to have some treatment? Um, Is it every day? Yeah, every morning I have... Um, uh, this pink tablet, yeah. what is about probably that size. Little one? Is well, big size? for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and anything else? Um, on the Sunday, we get this um, little one. What, if I get, if I don't vomit what I normally have, I have three points and my medicine has zero. Um, if I don't vomit, I get a point. Okay. And then every time when I get a point, if I get up to five, I get a wee game. Wow. <laughs> really? Ooh, that's special. Now, can you explain that a little yeah. better, Julie? For um, me? I, I, I did follow you, I understood that very well, but perhaps yeah, Julie it, can explain. It's um, important to recognise that every child's different mm. and the medication is very different. One of um, the things we often see, and as Simon said, is children that um, are walking that suddenly stop walking. Yeah. So the medication is designed um, to, to help stop that inflammatory process. Yeah. And what she's talking about is that, um, you know, 
med medicine for children at any time isn't good. And so she, she's getting points for, for what she's taking. Right. One of the common drugs they give um, uh, for the first uh, line of treatment is methotrexate. And a lot of people connect that with breast cancer, but it's in very low doses. And I think the big message to parents is um, talk to your doctor or ring up your local arthritis foundation and understand what's happening um, know when to recognise when there's a flare up, when there's symptoms yeah. and get help sooner rather than later. It was excellent that um, Simon and his family got Recognize treatment early because they find the longer you wait for treatment, the less the drugs work. So oh. it was fantastic. And this is why shows like this are fantastic to increase that awareness. Yeah, so really, I mean, our demographic, we, we aim for people over 50, but so we're looking at grandparents that maybe look after their grandchildren often to look out for these symptoms. And if they do recognise something that is wrong, that the child is looking awkward, um, to, to actually um, speak to your GP, well, speak to the parents first, but uh, recommend that they see a GP and, and uh, take some action. That's right, and sometimes you'll notice, and I, I don't know whether Lakeisha had it, um, there can be swollen knees or ankles, they feel quite warm, right. and in general the child feels miserable. Yeah. And, you know, because their body is trying to cope with um, a lot of things going on at once. Um, with adults too, arthritis does become a problem more in the winter. Do you find that with Lakeisha that she has more problems when it is cold? Uh, to be honest, she's a bit of a tough bugger, so she? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't let up a lot. Um, right. Which is, yeah, she's actually basically doesn't born complain. with it, so yeah. she's kind of used to it. Yeah. Um, she does her best. Uh, yeah, she has her bad days where she just tells tells me, Daddy, I don't want arthritis anymore. So no. it does affect her. Absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, we try and get her through it, and I think. Do she, you play she does lots of sport, job. Lakeisha? Yeah, I play netball. Do you? Mm. Do you dance? I wanted to do tap dancing. <gasps> wow, I love tap dancing. Mm. I don't do very well, but I, I love like tap dancing. I like the shoes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they're a lot of fun, aren't they? Now, also, your dad is doing something pretty special to help with arthritis SA yeah. for children. Yeah. And what's he going to do? He's going to do um, an arthritis run. A run. Well, it's not just any <laughs> run. A run. Would you <laughs> like to explain, Simon, what you're yeah, doing? Yeah, it's uh, basically called the uh, 777 marathon. Um, it kind of symbolises the 777 part of it. It is uh, seven marathons in seven days for my seven-year-old. Yeah. Um, I actually planned on doing a 666 marathon last year, but through injury it didn't happen. So I'm actually hoping that I can finally do this 777 a marathon because I don't want any more injuries and suddenly I have to do an 18 run marathon in 18 days for 18 year, 18 year old <laughs> girls so let's hopefully we can get this one underway but um, just looking at raising money and awareness uh, for our first paediatric uh, um, rheumatology uh, nurse mm -hmm. um, as Julie said I mean this is an increasing problem um, there's, I think, about 600 kids at the moment mm. in, really? yeah, in Adelaide that have this. And wow. really, we need the sources for a yeah. specialised uh, nurse um, to look after these kids. This is, you know, the few weeks delay, a few months delay can be really affective yeah. for the kids. So, yeah, yeah it's going to be a run from Yorktown to um, Arthritis SA. Right. It's 294 kilometres. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's nothing compared Huge. to what these kids go through. No, I mean, they run marathons every day. I'm yeah. only going for seven days. So the more well, money we can raise, the, the better. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we wish you well yeah, with thanks. that. We thank you very much for thank coming you. in and talking to us. And thank you, Lakeisha. And we wish you all the very best too. Please stay with us. There'll be more after this. Welcome back to Our Time. It's my great pleasure to introduce somebody who I haven't seen for how long, Janine? Well, you're, you, we were talking about 26, but it's probably 26 right. years. Well, that's is what it? we were. Well, been this is Janine time. Bryan, everyone. <laughs> oh, and goodness. Janine was an actor who worked on this program called You Don't Say. Mm, with you. On We Can't Remember Whether, <laughs> well, and 25 others. Yeah. Right? We can't remember whether it was 10 or 7. On, no. Because they swapped call signs here mm. in South Australia. But it was a great miming show. You had yes. to read little cards. We worked mime. forever to get all these fun. funny little hooks and yes. yeah, we were all cavorting <laughs> around like that forever. But who knew you had writing? 
Right. In you. Because at the time you were working with, was it Patch Theatre? I was with Patch Theatre and I'd just started dabbling in writing. Uh, I did some shows for, for Patch Theatre also. Oh, and you wrote for yes, I Humphrey did, as well? Yes, and then I wrote um, 11 scripts for Humphrey. And I'm um, not sure that whether you were in it at that time. I don't time, think so. But, no, um, um, and then, so I was sort of looking at various ways of where my writing would take me, even though I didn't know I was going to be a writer at the time. I never really set out to be a writer. As a child, did you write at uh, school? Very, very little. There was very little available. You did essays. A composition. We wrote essays. Yes, yes. And was you more intent on your, your spelling and yes, that kind was, of, and getting it? it done in time and things like that. So I had to unlearn a fair bit before I started writing. Not so much the creative writing, side of so things. Not so much the creative thing. No. I guess it's to do with the reading. For me, it was the reading that spurred me on to become oh, okay. a writer. Reading and other people's work. Reading other people's work and... And you and, realise what could be achieved. Yeah, and also um, when I became a teacher I was reading to my children at school and reading to my own daughters and it sort of got me, I suppose it was sort of a chance of, well, if you've got one side of the coin, what's the other side like? And I mm. guess if you've got a love of words and you follow that interest, you just want to see where it goes. That's true. Mm. But, uh, here's, a, here's a shot of a lot of the books that you've written, mm -hmm. which is quite extensive. Yes. In fact, I've got I'm a Dirty Dinosaur. We'll have a look at that in a tick because yeah. that's got a lovely story to it. So there's just a selection. Yeah, there's a, a range too of poetry, non-fiction, fiction, picture books. And this little girl here is um, a mad keen fe um, fan of I'm a Dirty Dinosaur and that shows me in my office where I work every day. Oh, OK. So religiously. There's, there's obviously a lot of books there and a lot of yes. things to keep up. Yes. They're not books you've written, you haven't written them all. They're no, no, they're library. files and research and so forth, yes. This book I find uh, absolutely fascinating because when you have a look at uh, the pictures here, they're actually painted with mud, you Yes, me. yes. Um, it's called I'm a Dirty Dinosaur and the illustrator decided that she really wanted something um, that made it look muddy and dirty. Excuse me, I've got to do what I used to do years ago, <laughs> reading stories to kids. Yeah, it's a lovely feeling, And isn't we it? had all the... Uh, I wish I had glasses on at this moment, but I spray it with mud and I tap it like a drum. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that um, <laughs> uh, the illustrator, Anne James, um, used mud from her own dam. So she actually got the mud and started she illustrating. She needs to get out more and buy some coloured paint, I'd say. <laughs> no, actually, it's a really interesting treatment of a book. It's a, yeah, it's great. And the, the it's, lovely bit with the dirty It word. is, it's lovely. And it's, it's done some really happy things too for us because it's won an award, but it's also won the Speech Pathology Award of Australia, which means that that speech pathologists are using it to, because of the love of language, of the, for the, getting the children involved, that repetition of, oh, okay. of sounds and rhythm that is so basic to, um, you know, enjoyment of books and stories oh, and fantastic, reading. Fantastic, mm. fantastic. So that was, that was lovely to have that done. So too. from doing this sort of book, you've moved on doing all sorts of well, stuff. Well, I, I think I'm a bit of a bit, so I really like a range of things. So mm. if you put me in a slot and said, "There's, you, you're a novelist, I'd, I probably would try to break out. But if you put me in a, a, a section and said, you're doing that, I'd probably break out. So I like to do a range of things. Um, but I love I love the concept of, of picture books. Mm. But you see, I've done a novel too. So a well, couple of novels, actually. That's, this, oops. Yep. Oh, sorry, your glasses right. were hiding in there. Um, but this is set here in... This is this was based in um, Moonta and Kadena and Wallaroo of South our, Australia. Of our yes. yes, our York Peninsula. Our, and this is yeah. where was the copper mines? The copper mines, yes, in the eighteen hundreds was was uh, miners came from right. Cornwall. I'm holding this up as mm. if as if it's it's but it's a book. It's just a regular <laughs> book without the dirty mud pictures. And That's right. Other sorts so of that stuff. was a novel. So this this of course came about because of my love of Australian history and my desire to sort of research the Cornish side of things and especially with, the, you know, being so close to it. Is there a pasty in there? Because it's not Cornish there without a pasty. There is a pasty, of course. And we've got mum making the pasty. Oh, and there's, exactly. of course, there's always that, um, you know, is, is, should, should the crust be at the top or should the crust be on the outside? Oh. Do you know? No idea. 
it should, I believe, be on the outside because the miners used to hold it. They would take By it the down. Crust. And then, of course, they could throw the crust away because That's they've my got dear father filthy... father saying, hoe into it. And hoe into it. Yes. Because when they were tin miners back in Cornwall, of course, they the, there was arsenic and they yes. developed it from of, that idea. Oh, right. And they would sometimes... So that's why yeah. there's a thing on a path. Yeah. Well, there you go. I know, See? it's wonderful. What you learn on this program mm, is extraordinary. Now, you've moved on with other things, of course. We've got some more photos here. Yeah. Just so we can get an understanding yeah. of what you've gone to next. Okay, well, this is, this is a winning shot of, of when uh, Anne James, the illustrator of Dirty Dinosaur, and I had just been um, given our award for our, our book. And it looks uh, like you were celebrating. Yes. Now, there's, there's, there you are. That's, if you were a Cornish miner, you would have worn one of those helmets. Now, that helmet was made of paper mache. Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't so, it? So it? Like a bowler very, hat. Yeah, very, very... Um, Lacking in, you know, solid protection. Frightening, isn't it? Yeah. And now we come to a bear. You might wonder what that's yes. got to do with it. What has that got to do with it? <laughs> well, this bear travelled on the back of a camel from Adelaide to Alice Springs mm -hmm. for a little girl whose parents were going to run the telegraph station in, oh, in, right. uh, in, okay. the, yeah, in yep. Alice Springs. Now, there we are. This is me with my... Um, with the bear. The illustrator's going to illustrate from that model. It's going to be called Where's Jessie? And it's a story about this. There's the first illustration. And this is... Uh, the bear actually goes on the back of a camel, Bertie, but falls off into the Australian outback. And so what brought that story into your mind? Was there anything... Well, it was because of the original bear that I saw mm. and I found out that it really had been um, something that had happened in real life. And often okay. I, I like having something that triggers me off like that rather than sitting and, think, and staring at a piece of blank paper and thinking, what can I write about? That makes sense. So, so therefore, Bertie, to me, had a story. So I did some research and then, we, um, and then I started working it from there. Mm. Amazing. And what? And we've got some more shots here yeah. too. Um, the, the important thing is though that all of this is just happening in your mind and it's mm. yearning to get out obviously. Mm. It's yearning to get out but it also needs an enormous amount of work and I, th I think that that sometimes you look at picture books say for example and you say well they're easy to read therefore they must be easy to write and they're not. They're very quite is difficult it, to is write. It, write. Is, it, um, is it getting the simplicity that's needed for children. Mm. It's not, yes, it's the simplicity of the story. The use of getting, simple words as well. Not necessarily describe. because books that are picture books are actually read mostly by adults or someone older to the child. Okay. It's that lovely sharing time. Yes. So therefore you don't always have to have the simplest of, of, of books, so, words. So out of the blue you suddenly end up going to Tibet, right? It was a place called Spitty. And was it there? And it's, it's in book, the Himalayan, yeah, it, that's evolved from it. It's oh, a series a nice... of poems. Oh, okay. um, and it's a it, it evolved because this is the kind of place I lived in for a month with um, with a family, none of whom spoke English. And I went up there because I went with an artist who wanted to paint those amazing um, mountains. And I assumed that I would be able to speak and get stories from the people and, and that was difficult. So what I ended up doing was photographing the children and then later, much later, I ended up writing poems about them and so, about and their style of here, that's right. About their style of life and what it means to them. So they're sort of more lyrical poems about about the children who live in that village We've in got the some sky. Shots, I think, of you yeah, in yeah, the sky. Yep. Yeah. Have a look. Coming. There you go. No, oh. no, this is research. This is researching for my next novel, which is a Chinese. Oh, okay. Moving on. And there we are, we're still researching the trek that the Chinese took from oh, Rome okay. to... Well, let's talk about that for a tick, because that's <laughs> what we're looking at. Well, the next novel is, is uh, at the moment, called Working Title, is called Yong, which is about a boy, a Chinese boy, who comes with his father, as many Chinese did, um, to work the goldfields in Victoria. But because there was a tax placed on them, they mm. were dropped off at Robe, and they <laughs> therefore had to walk from oh Robe goodness. to um, yes. to the goldfields, which was horrendous. And there was a lot of that that happened. People, yes, yeah, thousands people and to, thousands yeah. and thousands of people did well, that. Well, as you say, this is the research that you've got yeah. to discover the truth That's before right. you can really write about That's it. That's right. So these, these kinds of things need an enormous amount of research. 
So you're working on a couple of projects now. Yes. And one of them is that, obviously. Yeah, that's called is... Yong. And the other one is called Where's Jessie, which is the, the Little Bear book. Oh, OK. Yep. And then uh, we had another photo, I think, of... Can we bring the next one up? Uh, there's more research in China because I imagine this, this is what the Chinese men would have been doing whilst they were sitting around um, on their way to um, the, gold the gold fields. fields. Now, here I am. I'm talking to some children and this is where I am in the Himalayan mountains. It, that must have been an extraordinary experience. It was. Yeah. It was and I'd love to talk to you more, but we've actually run out of time. Yeah, Isn't that yep. so typical of television? We always run out of time. Thank you so much. It's been Pleasure. great to connect with you again Thanks after so many years. Thanks very much indeed. And Janice will be back with Cassandra after the break, who is a physiotherapist. And she's showing you how to do some abdominal exercises for any age. Stay with us here on At Home. Cassandra Zayner, our physiotherapist, is back with us. Thank you for coming in again. And Thanks we have us. Susan and Alastair have Absolutely. come in again. Now, what are we talking about this time? So today we thought we'd talk a little bit about knees and how to relieve pressure from knees and how to keep them strong. Right. So show us some things to do. Sure. So we're going to start off with a hamstring stretch at home. Um, again, you can do this lying on your floor or on the bed. And you use a belt or a towel to actually just support over the foot as you bring it up. And you'll feel a stretch down through that back of the thigh area. They're not doing very well. Now, obviously, for some of us, we can't get our leg up. Yes, you are high. right. You have spotted that. Um, <laughs> Sue and Alice there do a lot of really? yoga. Really? That's So wonderful. they are very flexible. So most people will probably get to that about far. there. So and the, you try and keep your legs straight, straight. not bent. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, I'll just get them to hold that for a moment, but some people talk about having restless legs at night time, um, and you can actually manage to reduce those symptoms by flushing through the sciatic nerve. So you could do that by oscillating the leg up and down. If you do 10 or 20 oscillations before you go to bed, you'll find that you'll have less of a uh, problem through the night. Wow. Mm. That's good. That's fantastic. So what we'll do now is just talk a little bit about strengthening around the knee and we're going to go into a um, bridge position. Those of you who saw the hip segment um, would have seen that, um, that exercise. So curling your tail under and rolling up into a bridge position again is a really fantastic way to strengthen through the glutes which offloads the knee. And strengthens the abdominals as, as well. As well as the abdominals. you have to concentrate on the abdominals. Definitely. To, to as that. well as your stair climbing muscles. So this is a really good one and again when that gets easy you can keep your hip, hips level and lift one leg up and hold. They do make it look easy don't they? they? Do. <laughs> and relax down. So we're just Wonderful. going to go into a um, quad stretch now. So we're going to do this lying on your side um, and Sue and Alistair will demonstrate you just hold your foot behind you and take your foot towards your bottom. Now some people can't get into this position. If that's the case, rest your foot on a chair and then you can actually just slowly lower yourself down to feel a stretch in the front of the thigh. And if you can do it without holding on to something, then that's very good for your balance too. Absolutely, <laughs> very good. Um, we're just going to go over now into a downward dog position, which most people would know from yoga. This stretches the calf, which is a really important <coughs> muscle not to forget with the knee, as well as the hamstring. Fantastic. That's great. And very last one is a, another strengthener. We're going to go into a small <coughs> gym stretch, yep, and then just just lunging up and down. For everyone at home, obviously, this is something that is meant to be very easy for you, but don't, these, this couple are very fit, so uh, don't expect it to all happen overnight. <laughs> exactly. But keep trying. <coughs> Thank you very much, Cassandra, My for pleasure. coming Thanks in again. Thanks for having Thank us. You, Thank Alistair you, Alastair and Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we hope you've been exercising. Janice, you didn't even work up a sweat. No, look at that. See, it was just that easy. <laughs> never, it's never, I kid you, it's never that easy. Planking, I think we should all take up planking. Planking's very good. Yes. It, because it uses every muscle in your body. Did you know that? Except when you plank? your brain, probably. Oh, no, no, I think it probably affects that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, we'd love you to keep in touch with us because every week we put up on Facebook who's going to be on the program this week. So it doesn't matter where you are in Australia, you can check out where we are and who we're talking to. So Janice, until yes. next time on our time. Yes, please join us then and take care. And we'll hope keep to see you. Keep yourself nice to me. Bye. Bye.